I keep saying that standards are very important. They are the single most important um, topic in the syllabus. Why do I keep saying this? And personally, I have facts and I'll show you shortly that at least 70% of the FR paper is based on IFRS standards, either directly or indirectly, directly from IFRS. So if you know your IFRS, if you've studied your IFRS, you are well equipped to easily pass this paper. I want you to put it in your mind somewhere that the FR paper is passable. It's not as scary as it's made out to be. Once you know your stuff, once you've learned the standards, you have a very good exam technique and you answer all questions, you will pass the exam. So I'll show you that um, getting to the end of the series. But for now, let's focus on why we are here today, which is for IFRS Deep Dive. So let's take a look at November 2020. Um, before we even start solving past questions today and all of that, let's look at what happened in November 2020. And then we will take it from there. So in November 2020, what happened? In question one, question one was for 20 marks and they tested consolidations as usual. So you were required to prepare the consolidated statements of profit or loss and other comprehensive income and the consolidated statements of financial position. Now, if you are aware, whether or not you know this, Consolidations are based on a number of standards, but the key ones are IFRS 3, Business Combinations, and IFRS 10, Consolidated Financial Statements. So the entire note in that question was based on these two standards. Obviously, if it's a question that has an associate in it, then obviously you need to look at IS 28, Investment in Associates, right? With that out of the way, let's look at what question 2 was on. Take note, we've looked at 20 marks so far, all on IFRS. Question two was the pure IFRS question, which over the years I've seen the trend in the recent um, syllabus is that question two, the examiner dedicates it purely to testing you on IFRS for 20 marks. There were four sub-questions. First was six marks. The second sub-question was four marks. The third was four marks. And the fourth was six marks, making 20 marks. Out of these 20 uh, marks, the first sub-question tested IES 37 on provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets. The next sub-question tested IES 36 on impairment of assets. The third sub-tested IES 23 on borrowing costs. And then the fourth tested IES 40 on investment property. So once again, you can see we've made 40 marks purely on IFRS. And regardless of what someone says about consolidations, whether you need to learn the technique, note that every technique you are learning, whether to compute goodwill, to compute NCI, or to eliminate intra-group transactions, all of those things are provided within IFRS 3 and IFRS 10. In fact, the formula to compute goodwill, which is fair value of consideration plus fair value of NCI at acquisition, less fair value of net asset at acquisition is given, provided clearly in IFRS 3. So it is undisputable that this, these two questions are based on IFRS. What about question 3? Let me show you. Question 3 is the usual published accounts question where they give you a trial balance and they ask you to prepare what? Financial statements. In some years, they give you um, an already prepared financial which you call redrafting. So with note, you are required to redraft those financial statements. Now, in this November 2020 paper, there were a number of notes. The question had six footnotes in total for students to adjust. The first note was on IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers. The second note was on IES 2, inventory. The third note was on IFRS 16 on leases. The fourth note was on IES 16, on property, plants, and equipment. The fifth note was on IES 12, income taxes. And the sixth note, even though it looked like it was a write-off of a bad debt, which is a receivables impairment, that is clearly provided for under IFRS 9 financial instruments. Because as we'll learn shortly, financial um, receivables are financial assets under IFRS 9 classification. So you've seen that so far, 60 marks, purely on IFRS. And once again, I want to reiterate that if you have a solid knowledge of IFRS, none of these questions should beat you because the principles being tested are well documented in the standards. Let's go. Question four. 
Question four is your typical question on ratios and interpretation, including what? Writing a report. It will surprise you that there was question 4C, which once again tested standards for four marks. So the examiner said, give me the limitations of earnings per share. Now, if you are aware, there's a separate standard called IS33 on earnings per share. So once again, you can see that even in a question where they were required to test you on ratios, and report writing and interpretation, they found a way to sneak in their accounting standards or IFRSs somewhere. Then in question five, which has become over the past few years, past three sittings, it has become the question where they test you on ethics, they test you on the accounting framework or the financial reporting framework, and they find a way to always insert some IFRSs there. So what did we have in November 2020? It was 16 marks on standard. So as you can see, I'm saying the A part was on ethics for four marks out of the way. The B part was on the conceptual framework for financial reporting. Now, take note that even though that a conceptual framework, the International Accounting Standards Board says it is not a standard in and of itself, it is deemed to be as part of what it helps to interpret standards. It serves as the framework under which standards are developed. So I will bring it under IFRSs for this discussion purposes. There was a question on the framework for three marks. Then sub question C, tested financial instruments, that's IFRS 9, for six marks. And then the final question, which is becoming a trend also, they always ask something about groups or consolidations when it comes to the theory part or the written part of it. There was a question on that for five marks from IFRS 10, consolidated financial statements. If we add all of this together, it gives us 80 marks. Ladies and gentlemen, out of 100 marks, 80 related to financial reporting standards. So this, for me, goes to show that financial reporting standards are very important. And please, with the, part, the next um, few days you have to your exam, dedicate a significant amount of your time to knowing the standards through and through. Learn the standards so well because as I'll show you over the next seven days, every single thing I do, I will refer to what the standard says. If you know your standards, I promise you, you will pass FR. Obviously, if you also have a good exam technique, right? So, with this out of the way, we've seen, me, I said at least 70% of the um, marks will be from standards. But you can see, even in November 2020, I just ended sitting the examiner went as high as 80 marks out of 100. Any student who went into the exam hall without learning IFRSs was guaranteed to fail. Guaranteed. And anyone who went there with a very good knowledge of IFRS, a very good knowledge of double entry accounting, which is very important, I'll tell you shortly, and a good knowledge of answering exam questions, ensuring they answer all the five questions within the period of time, allocating time equally to every question would ensure that a person would pass the exam so finally before we start solving past exam questions on ifrs's and revising in general what does the examiner say about ifrs's in the financial reporting exam so let's look at the examiner's report quickly what has he been saying in the november 2020 exam the examiner said something in his report he said the heading he gave was abysmal understanding of international financial reporting standards he used the word abysmal. It means he was disappointed in you guys. I mean, those who wrote. It can never be one of you once you are here, right? So, abysmal understanding of IFRS. He said most candidates either did not attempt questions on IFRS or they provided answers with no bearing on IFRS. Here, he's trying to tell you something that some people did not attempt. They didn't bother because they didn't study IFRS. Or the answers they gave had nothing to do with IFRS. So please, it's important to know your IFRSs. What did he say again? He said, and please watch this carefully. This is dear to my heart. He says, given that financial reporting is all about... I, I didn't say that as examiner. It's all about IFRS. The examiner has said himself that the financial reporting exam is all about IFRS. He's saying the examiner should consider assigning more weight to IFRS cases in future examinations. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a clue. This was from November 2020. 
the examiner himself said in his report, his own report, that people don't understand IFRS. He knows for sure, he agrees with me, that IFRSs are the basis of financial reporting. In fact, the exam is called financial reporting. So you must know international financial reporting standards, right? Only makes sense. So he's saying that he's going to attach more weight to IFRSs in future examinations. So please take note, this is what he has told you. This was November 2020. What did he say in May 2020? Same old story. He said the following are notable weaknesses of candidates in the paper. Many candidates performed poorly in the IFRSs or the IASs, the International Accounting Standards. This suggests the lack of adequate preparations in this what important aspect of the paper. He's once again reiterating, he's once again emphasizing the importance of IFRSs in the financial reporting exam. What else did he say in November 2019? This is the last one we look at, and then we move on to solving questions. He said, suggested areas in which such trends can be enhanced include the international financial reporting standards and notes and adjustments in the preparation of financials. I just mentioned that all the notes are based on what? IFRS. So the examiner is telling you that students should increase their preparation or add more preparation time when it comes to the IFRS and when it comes to the adjustments to the notes, which are in and of themselves IFRSs anyways. So ladies and gentlemen, with this out of the way, I've made my point that IFRSs are important. They are the single most important thing in the exam. And with that out of the way, let us begin to look at some questions, some real past exam questions from the past three sittings on international financial reporting standards. Now let's start the past exam questions. Let's go through recent past exam questions and then let's see how we can quickly use all of these different questions from different years to revise our concept. Now, this question can be downloaded. The link can be found, I think I'll place it somewhere down there in the um, description box. I'll drop it in the comments again for those who might miss it. Feel free to download and then work along with us. My recommended approach is that please have um, a, a pen and paper or a book, whatever, and work along with us. Do not just watch us do it, be active, participate. If you are stuck somewhere, please type a comment. Feel free to ask any question, get back to you at any time. Um, it's important you participate fully to get the most benefit out of this. So let's start. The first question we'll be looking at is from the November 2020 sitting. That was just your, just ended exam sitting. This was um, question 2C of the FR paper and it was for four marks. So typically in question two, the examiner breaks down the question into so many sub parts and he tests the standards. What I'll be doing today is if I just solve the question, what value would I have added to you guys? Not much because the solutions can be found online, right? But what I'll do is to make sure you understand the standard number one and number two. And most important, obviously, is how should you attempt a question to ensure that in your mind you are looking to pass the question itself? Right. So no matter what the examiner asks you, you should be able to steal some marks because don't forget that out of the 100 marks on exam day, your goal is to score at least 50 and whatever way you use to do it, you must still do it. Right. So in this question, they are saying that required is in accordance with IS 23 borrowing cost. Show the appropriate calculations and the amount that should be capitalized in the financial statement of trophy for the year and then 31st March 2019. Now, what I recommend you do in every exam is no matter what the question is, always read the requirement first. Read the requirement first before you read the question. It will tell you what the examiner wants you to do and where to focus your attention on as you are reading the question. So here they are saying in accordance with IS23 borrowing costs, show the appropriate calculations and the amount that should be capitalized in the financial statement, right? So let's read the question. On 1st April, and before we even start, what's the year end? The year end is what? Let's take note of that here. The year end is 31st March, 2019. Okay. 
So they are saying on 1st April 2018. So you ask yourself, how long ago was this? This is clearly 12 months ago, right? So this is a full one year. So on 1st April 2018, Trophy Limited borrowed 15 million, okay, CDs in order to partly fund the construction of a new building all right the interest rate was six percent payable annually in arrears on first july so take note first timeline or first date is first april that's when they borrowed right all right so that's when they borrowed and then on um first july right here so first july what did they do construction commenced good commenced construction and i'll tell you what what this means shortly then on first october 2018 10 million cities was paid to the contractor at the first stage payment then on 1st December 2018, a further 10 million was paid to the contractor. However, construction was still in progress at the reporting date of 31st March. We have a lot of information here, but only a few are relevant. Let's run over quickly. 1st April 2018 was when they went to borrow 15 million to fund the construction of a new building. And I'll talk about that very soon. Interest rate was 6%. On 1st July 2018, construction commenced. So 1st July 2018, they, cons um, they commenced construction. Then on um, 1st October 2018, 10 million CDs okay, was paid to the contractor as a first stage payment. Then on 1st December 2018, a further 10 million was paid to the contractor. So... We've been told also that construction was still in progress. Now, before we even solve this question, maybe you've forgotten what IS-23 is about. Let me use a minute or two to quickly refresh your knowledge on IS-23 so that going into the exam, you know what the standard is about. Take a read of it, obviously, but let's quickly summarize. So IS-23, borrowing costs, prescribes the accounting treatment for obviously what? Borrowing costs. The standard talks about something called a qualifying asset. So all borrowing costs that are incurred in the construction. So it's either the construction or the acquisition of a qualifying asset can be capitalized as part of the cost of the asset. What this means is you can add those borrowing costs, those interest costs, those costs of borrowing or incurring the funds to the cost of the asset on the statement of financial position. You add them together and capitalize it. But there are conditions, right? The standard says that you can only capitalize or capitalization should commence. So commencement of capitalization so capitalization should commence when expenditures are being incurred. So expenditures are being incurred or borrowing costs. Borrowing costs are being incurred. And then what? The activities. So let's call it necessary activities. The activities that are necessary to prepare the asset for its intended use or sale are in progress so take note once expenditures are being incurred on the qualifying assets once borrowing costs are being incurred on the qualifying asset and once the necessary activities that are relevant to prepare the asset for its intended use or sale are being undertaken then you need to commence capitalization but how does the standard define a qualifying asset the standard says a qualifying asset is any asset that takes a what? Substantial period of time. So here, remember, the term is what? Substantial period of time. Right? It takes a substantial period of time for the assets to get ready for its intended use or sale. 
the standard does not define substantial period of time but just know that's how it defines a qualifying asset so we've looked at when to commence capitalization when should you seize capitalization right so if or even before we go to when you seize capitalization let's still on commencement of capitalization if you borrow funds from what let's say you borrow specific funds you go for a specific loan like this particular question right you are required to use what the specific expense or the specific borrowing as the um, borrowing cost amount so here if it's six percent then the interest rate so for specific borrowings we use what specific expense incurred if you have a general pool of borrowings then the standard says use what the weighted average borrowing cost right applicable to the general pool so take note you could have a specific loan like we have in this question we'll be solving shortly or you could have what general pool of borrowings the standard says that if you earn any income from the temporary investment of the borrowings you need to deduct that from the borrowing cost. So final borrowing cost you capitalize. So your capitalized borrowing cost should equal what? All borrowing costs minus what? Income from what? Temporary investment. This question doesn't have this element, but take note. If you have a question where they tell you within a period of time, they invested the um, fund and they made some returns on investment you need to add those returns on investment to the i mean you need to deduct the returns on investment from the borrowing cost and you capitalize the difference and finally you need to what seize capitalization or let's even talk about suspension first so suspension you need to suspend capitalization when what happens you need to suspend cap um, capitalization during periods when what your active development is what interrupted so any period when active development is interrupted you need to pause or um, suspend your capitalization temporarily you need to finally seize capitalization when something happens and it's simple all the standard says is that seize capitalization when the word is substantially so when substantially all the activities that are necessary to prepare the asset for its intended use or, or sale are complete, then you need to stop capitalization at that point and you add whatever you have to um, the cost of the asset on the balance sheet. With that out of the way, let's start this particular question. So back here, they are saying show the appropriate amounts that will be capitalized, right? So let's start. In this question, let's take note of the key dates. We are saying that it's a four mark question also. So in general, in your mind, you should be looking at making four points or four distinct points to make your marks, no matter how the examiner tries to apportion his marks. So quickly, we can just make a point. This is question 2C. So let me just. All right. Question 2C here. So we are saying um, quickly, IS23 prescribes the accounting treatment for borrowing costs okay that is out of the way now here on 1st april 2018 15 million CDs is the specific borrowing. Remember I said there are two types of borrowings. It has a general pool of borrowings or specific, right? So this is a specific borrowing at what? At 6% per Annum, right so we know that the 15 million is the specific borrowing amount that we need to consider for capitalization purposes good we've made this point our next point will be on the fact that construction of 
qualifying assets commenced on which date here first july stated here 2018 on first july 2018 and remember i told you that you only commence capitalization when expenditures are being incurred with respect to what the construction or the acquisition of a qualifying asset so here they are saying that they started construction on first july but hold on one second construction of the qualifying asset commenced on first july 2018 yes but watch what the question says it says on 1st october 2018 10 million was paid to the contractor as the first stage payment remember i told you that capitalization will commence when three main criteria are met first is that what borrowing costs are being incurred expenditures are being incurred and then let me remind you here so then the necessary activities to get the assets ready for its intended use or sale have also commenced so expenditures are being incurred borrowing costs are being incurred and necessary activities have commenced now in as much as the construction has commenced are they incurring any expenditure and the answer is no so as at first july 2018 no expenditure has been incurred with respect to constructing this particular asset so it is not until first october 2018 here when the first payment is made where they've incurred expenditure that we commence borrowing cost so we say expenditure relating to borrowing costs are incurred on 1st october 2018 and the amount is what 10 million so at this point we can begin to make some computation so what is our year end 31st march 2019 right so from 1st october to 31st march how many months do we have here if you count your fingers you realize you have what six months so it means the period of capitalization is a period of six months the question gave us the interest rate so the borrowing cost or the finance cost to be capitalized so we say borrowing costs to be capitalized in the six month period from 1st October 2018 to 31st March 2019 equals what so the amount is what they said it's 10 million so we have our 10 million times what six months so times six out of 12 and then what is the interest rate it was given to us clearly here at what six percent so times six percent so let me pull out my calculator um give me a second so ten thousand it's in millions but i've truncated to thousands just for ease of calculation so times um six over twelve so times 0 0.06 then times six over twelve should give me let me use 0 0.5 it's half this should give me 300 but in thousands, it gives me what? 300,000 CDs. So this is the borrowing cost I will capitalize for the first payment they made all the way to year end, 300,000 Ghana CDs. But take note, they are saying that on 1st December 2018, a further 10 million was paid to the contractor. So here, we need to take note that they made a second payment, they think a second borrowing cost with respect to a qualifying asset. So we say second payments borrowing costs would equal what once again they paid 10 million but hold on a second this is where most students will probably be caught um, pants down so here watch carefully how much did they borrow 15 million they borrowed 15 million for the 
construction of a qualifying asset, the standard is called borrowing cost for a reason. It is cost for borrowing. Borrowing to either construct your own asset or to buy the asset. So it means that if anybody uses their own funds that was not borrowed to construct a qualifying asset, it doesn't qualify as borrowing cost. Watch it carefully. If someone borrows, let's do this. If someone borrows 15 million and they spend 10 million, how much do they have left? Five, right? But here, they, they pay the guy 10 million. So it means out of this 10 million payment, the company had their own 5 million added as a top up to make the payment. What this means is we can only qualify the extra 5 million as borrowing cost and not the whole 10 million. So here, what this means is that the borrowing cost will be on what? On 5 million. Right? Times here, it is what? From the month of 1st December. So if you count your fingers once again, December, January, February, March, 2019 will give me four months. So times what? Times four over 12 times 6%. So please take note here. Remember, the point is that you do not compute borrowing costs on amounts that were not borrowed. It must be borrowing you have borrowed to give to a borrowing cost. So here we have 5 million times um, 0 0.06 times 4 over 12. Okay. All right. So this times 0 0.06 times. Then calculator is messing Give me a second. 0 0.06 times. Okay. Okay. So this will give me. One hundred thousand Ghana CDs. So this is the borrowing cost. So you can mention quickly. It probably will not give you any extra marks. If you don't have time, don't do it. But just mention that only five million out of the second ten million CDs payment. qualifies as a borrowing right so that's what they actually brought they brought 15 million so if you are trying to look at um, what would be borrowing cost then it is this 10 million here plus what 5 million any extra that is dispensed doesn't qualify so to answer the question they are saying show the appropriate calculations and the amount that should be capitalized it means the amount that should be capitalized in total is 300,000 Ghana CDs for the um, six month period to the year end plus 100,000. So that gives us a total of what? So total borrowing cost to be capitalized. Total borrowing costs to be capitalized will equal what? 300,000. Plus what? Plus 100,000. And this gives us clearly an amount of what? 400,000. If you can do this, ladies and gentlemen, this will give you a cool four marks. And you can see this is something you must know. And I recommend that students always attempt their IFRS questions. Please do it. Don't leave any question unanswered, right? And this is some easy four marks for you to get. So remember that the concept is on borrowing cost and it must be on um cost that you incur towards to borrow really so if it's not um, a real borrowing cost you should not be capitalizing that amount all right let's look at the next question which is on a very interesting topic financial instrument and um, there are many candidates who do not like financial instruments but i'll show you why it's an easy topic and why you shouldn't fear financial instruments at all because it is within your reach to pass questions that are on financial instruments so let's begin what does the question say like I said, always read the requirements before you read the question. So what does the requirement say here? They are saying in accordance with IFRS, nine financial instruments. How much should be recognized in Asamankesi financial statements in respect of the above transaction for the year ended 31st July 2019? And they said do it to two decimal places. This is for five marks. 
it's quite significant where am i taking this question from it's from the may 2020 fr paper question 2c what we looked at just um, now on borrowing cost was on from the november 2020 sitting this is from the may 2020 exam sitting so here let's take the question asaman kese limited okay asaman kese purchased a six percent so this is the rate on the bond it's a 50 million cd bond and they purchased it on first august 2018 at a 10 percent discount to par value so this is a discount bond I will show you how to treat that shortly. Expenses of purchase were 500,000 CDs. We call these transaction costs. The technical term within the standard is what? Transaction costs. And I will show you a simple framework to simplify financial instruments for you forever. In case you don't know, so don't worry. The bond is due for redemption on 31st July 2028. So this is clearly a redeemable bond. It means at the end of the 2028 period, the bond holder can get a return or will get a return of their principal plus the last interest payment. It's a redeemable bond, meaning the, you get a payment of your um, initial principal amount when you redeem the bond. Then the effective annual interest rate to maturity is 7.3%. So you can see if you've solved enough questions on this, they always give you the coupon rate, right? Which is the rate of interest on the bond, which is paid on the face value of the bond. And they also give you something called the effective interest rate, which we'll use for the loan amortization. And then they are saying they intend to hold the bond until maturity. This is something we need to consider within IFRS 9. It has met one of two criteria, which we, we have one called the business model test and then the contractual cash flows characteristics test. Don't worry whether you don't know it or not. I'll simplify it for you shortly. So this is what we have from um, financial instruments. Maybe it is scary. You are wondering, how do I solve this? So before we start, let me break financial instruments down for you to a level you can understand and even work with this framework in your mind. But please, obviously, after today, make it a point that you will read financial instruments and try to get a very in-depth understanding of this very important standard, which is tested in every single exam question. So it comes in every sitting. So why not master it now? So let's, let's look at financial instruments, right? Let me try to simplify this for you. So... Let's create this framework here. Okay. So when it comes to financial instruments, right? Financial instruments. There are a number of standards that deal with financial instruments. So we have IES 32, which is on financial instruments presentation. Then we have IFRS 9, which is the main financial instrument standard. It has come to replace IES 39 on financial instruments recognition and measurement. Then we have one that is not tested too often, which is IFRS 7 on financial instruments disclosures. So these are the main standards when it comes to financial instruments that students need to be aware of. But the key ones will obviously be IES 32 and IFRS 9. Now, when it comes to classification of financial instruments, let me use a simple framework to summarize it for you in a few minutes. Now, financial instruments could either be financial assets or financial liabilities, right? So you either have a financial asset or you have a financial liability, right? Okay. Now, let's look at financial assets into a lot more detail. When it comes to financial assets, let's look at something called initial measurement. All financial assets have one initial measurement. So I'll teach you initial measurement. I'll teach you subsequent measurement and we are done, right? Quickly. So please learn this. This is what you need to know in your mind. All financial assets, initial measurement. So initial measurement what the standard says is that the initial measurement of financial asset 
should be at fair value plus transaction cost right unless unless the financial instrument so this is what unless unless the financial instrument is classified as what fair value through p and l in which case the transaction cost will be written off to p and l as an expense let me take that again see this is very important to remember let me take that again. For financial instruments, initial measurement is what fair value plus transaction cost. It means the fair value of the financial instrument, you add all transaction cost. In this question, remember they said what? Here, let me show you. They said what? The expenses of purchase here was 500,000. So that's the transaction cost, right? So the standard says initial measurement is fair value plus transaction cost. But if the question tells you that the instrument is measured at fair value through p and l then you do not add transaction cost to the fair value to capitalize it as the financial asset but you expense the transaction cost to p and l so this is what expensed to p and l so take note the default is fair value plus transaction cost for initial measurement or initial recognition but if it's a um, fair value through p and l um, financial assets then we write off the transaction cost to PL and we only capitalize the fair value on the balance sheet with that out of the way for initial measurement let's look at the rules for what subsequent measurement you know for every standard they give you initial measurement and they give you what so subsequent measurement now, under subsequent measurement, it depends whether it is what an equity instrument or a debt instrument. So, let's look at for equity. Please, this framework I'm creating for you, if you remember this, it will be easy for you to um, conceptualize every other financial instrument uh, you get. For equity instrument, the default, the default is fair value through profit or loss so it means here you remeasure the financial instrument or the financial asset at every year end and you take every gain or loss to p and l there is also an option so option two is to use fair value through other comprehensive income or fair value through oci here the standard says there must be something called a strategic intent right to hold the asset strategic incent to hold the asset then if you have this particular intention then you use fair value through oci so take note subsequent measurement for equity instruments under financial assets the default is what to use fair value through p and l or if you have a strategic intent to hold the asset then you use fair value through oci how about debt instruments because you know it's either going to be equity or what debt for debt instruments and the financial asset the standard provides one or a number of approaches the first one is called the amortized cost approach and the amortized cost you must fulfill two tests before you can capitalize borrowing um, you can sorry before you can what recognize the financial instruments subsequently under the amortized cost um, approach or the amortized cost model the first is called the business business model test and the second is the contractual cash flow test not to bore you too much with details the business model test is simply when you have the intention to hold the asset onto maturity date that is all so you can see in this question what did they tell us watch carefully you see the examiner is giving you a clue that as Samanke say intends to hold the bond onto maturity it means what as Samanke say has met the business model test over here so you see why if you know the standard, every question will be an easy walk in the park for you because 
they've told you here that they have the intention to hold the asset until maturity and that is the technical definition of business model test the standard is clear that if you have the intention to hold the asset until maturity date then you have met the business model test what is the contractual cash flow test simple where you are going to hold the asset for the fact that you want to receive the contractual cash flows that will come from holding the asset so once you meet the business model test and you meet the contractual cash flow test as well then you use the amortized cost method but what if you meet the contractual cash flow test here right but you do not meet the business model test which is you don't have the intention to hold the asset onto maturity then the standard gives you the opportunity to recognize or to use fair value through other comprehensive income for the debt instrument specifically so the two main ones are amortized cost and fair value through oci but there is a very less used option which is fair value through pnl for some debt instrument here it is uh, provided that you only use this when it eliminates a measurement inconsistency so take note quick recap for financial instruments you are either going to have what a financial asset or a financial liability right when we look at financial assets we are saying for financial assets the initial measurement will be at what fair value plus transaction cost unless it is recognized as a fair value through PL instrument in which case you write off the transaction cost to PL as an expense right and then we came to the subsequent measurement where we said you have two approaches and it depends whether you are dealing with what equity instruments or debt instruments for equity instrument the default is to use fair value through PL. you have option two where it's fair value through oci so if it's fair value through PL, you take all changes to PL. if it's fair value through oci you take all changes recognized towards oci but OCI, you must have a strategic intent to hold the asset onto maturity to collect the cash flows associated with that asset. Now, we came to amortized costs under debt instrument, right? I think amortized costs, you must meet two characteristics or two tests. The first is the business model test. The second is the contractual cash flow test. We said the business model test is when you have what? The intent to hold the asset onto maturity. Then the contractual cash flow test is when you are holding the asset and you are going to collect all the cash flows related to the asset if you fail to meet the contractual cash flow test but you manage to meet the business model test then you can use fair value through oci for your debt instrument there's a less known one known as fair value through pnl um, which is when the standard says it eliminates measurement inconsistency so this is for financial assets financial liabilities even have a more simplified uh, recognition so for financial liabilities, most of this will mirror the financial assets. So let's even do it this way. For financial liabilities, their initial measurement, the standard says it will be at what? Fair value net of transaction cost. So take note, for financial liabilities, we don't have any case. Take note for assets we add unless it's fair value through PNL. Financial liabilities, initial measurement is fair value net of transaction cost. And then subsequently, you have two main approaches. It's either you use amortized cost, which is the same amortized cost we have. You must meet two tests, business model test and contractual cash flows test. Or you do fair value through PL. So that is it for financial liabilities. It's either your initial measurement will be at what fair value minus transaction cost. And then your subsequent will be either amortized cost or fair value through P and L. So this is it. If you know this framework in your mind, no matter what question they ask you on financial instruments, you should be able to what answer it. With this knowledge that we have at our fingertips, let us now come and try to attempt um, this question. So we've been told here that Asaman Kese purchased a 6% 50 million CD bond on 1st August 2018 at a 10% um, discount to par value. We call this a discount bond, like I said earlier. What it means is that we need to what, 
compute 90% of the face value. But before we even get there, let's ask ourselves, is this a financial asset or a financial life? So every question you have, ask yourself, is this a financial asset or is it a financial liability? First question you ask yourself. So if Asamankesi goes to buy a bond, it means they are not the issuer of the bond. So they will not be incurring interest expense, rather they will be what? Receiving um, coupon payment. So this is clearly what? A financial asset. This is clearly a financial asset. Because what? They have purchased the bond and they will be receiving what? Coupon payment. If it's a financial, what did I say? I said financial asset, the default is what? Initial recognition is fair value plus what? Transaction cost. If you remember, unless it is what? Recognized as fair value through PL, in which case you what? Write up the transaction cost to PL. How do I know this instrument will not be fair value through PL? I know it to be at amortized cost because here they are saying they intend to hold the bond to maturity. And I just said that this means that they have met what? The business model test. So this is clearly what an amortized cost instrument. So we need to state in the question. So this is question 2C. So we say question 2C. Say um, Asa Mankesis Financial Asset will be measured using the amortized cost approach since both the business model test and the contractual cash flow tests have been satisfied. How do I know it's been satisfied? Once you meet the business model test, which is what you intend to hold on to maturity, then obviously you intend to hold to what collect the cash flows, right? It's, it just makes sense that way. So here, once it's amortized cost, then I know that initial recognition will be fair value plus transaction cost. Because I told you that what the default is initial recognition for financial assets is what fair value plus transaction cost, unless it is what fair value through PL, in which case you write up the transaction cost to what PL. So here we will say initial me measurement of financial assets will equal what fair value plus what transaction costs now let's find the fair value the fair value will be what they said they bought a 50 million cd bond but it was at a 10% discount. So it will simply be if you got a discount of 10% or the bond was discounted by 10%, that's what it means. It's a discount bond. It means that what effectively you paid 90% of the value of the bond. So 90% of um, 50 million will be the fair, the fair value of the bond, right? So let me find uh, 90 percent of 50 will give me so this is what 45 million cities is the fair value of the bond what is my transaction cost the question said is what 500,000 cities so that's clearly be um, 0 0.5 million right so fair value plus transaction cost so i'll say Fair value plus transaction cost will be what? 
my 45 million plus my 0 0.5 million and this will clearly give me 45.5 million so this is the fair value plus transaction cost that i will recognize with respect to this financial asset and i know this only because of this framework i developed up here so please make sure you know this through and through if you don't understand this and um, you can always go back and watch um this this session but remember that fair value remember this model it is what will help you um blaze through every financial instrument question right they look scary but they are not so it means 45.5 is will be what will be capitalized as the um value of the financial asset so we'll say that what amount to be recognized initially on the statement of financial position is what 45.5 million right good now because it is amortized cost we need to do sub something called what subsequent measurement so we say under subsequent measurement which is amortized costs what will happen and the amortized cost we need to prepare something called an amortization schedule and don't be scared it's nothing deep the format is the same all the time you put the same figures at the same place all the time so don't worry it's a table that looks like this so create these columns create your year create your opening balance right create your interest right create your payment and then oops let me adjust the positions let me just change it with space so you create your interest then payment and then you have what your closing balance right okay so which year are we in this is the year ended what 2019 what is the opening balance it is what we just found here as what the initial amount so here we are going to put the opening balance of what 45.5 here the interest this second this column here this third column here for you you always put here the amount which is the effective interest here they gave it to us to be what 7.3 so please always remember what goes here is the effective interest so in your question just look for the effective interest and slot it under this particular column so let's let's find 7.3 percent right of 45.5 so calculator 0.073 times 45.5 it gives me 3.3215 the examiner said we should do everything to two decimal places right so let's just leave it at 3.32 like the examiner said we should do so 3.32 right this column for payment is where you put the coupon rate coupon rate not effective interest so here coupon rate is the rate that is stated on the face of the bond so here this is a six percent bond so i put here what six percent but please take note coupon payments are always made on the face value of the bond not the discounted value what do i mean remember that the bond was originally worth what look here 50 million but we got a 10 percent discount we use the discount here when we're doing the capitalization so right here we said what 90 percent or 50 but when it comes to the coupon the coupon payments are always made on face value so you can learn in your mind somewhere that coupon payments are always made on face value amount if you don't know this write it down somewhere coupon payments are always made on face value amount so here 
this six percent will not apply it on 45.5 no we come and apply it to what the 50 million the initial raw amount right so please find six percent of what 50 million and that will be the interest or coupon payment amount so six percent of 50 million will give me what three million so i put here what three and this will be less because you are amortizing so you add the interest you add this interest to amortize or to increase this amount then you decrease the words um the interest payment amount all right so now let's add 45.5 plus 3.32 minus 3 what would that, that give us that's what we're looking for so calculator 45.5 plus 3.32 minus 3 will give me 45.82 so 45.82 is the closing balance the question wants for the year ended 31st july 2019 we bought it on 1st august 2018 so clearly this is what we are required to do so 45.82 is the value of the bond at the end of the year and um, realistically so this is the value of the bond now what goes into the financials because the question said how much you recognize in a samankes's financial statement they didn't just say the balance sheet so i need to show you what will go where right so let me clean off oops let me just end here all right so let's talk about the pnl or the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income first and then we talk about the statement of financial position. So in the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, this is an extract. What we show in the PL is clearly how much the finance charge, this finance interest charge here. So we have what? Finance income of 3.32 million. Why am I saying income? Remember, this is a financial asset. Financial asset means I bought, so the person will be making payments to me. So this is a finance income. If it was a financial liability, it would have been a finance what, expense or a finance cost take note of this so this will be my um finance income and the other income or under finance income in the statement of profit or loss then what goes to the balance sheet or what goes to the statement of financial position as at 31st july 2019 it's simple this figure we have here 45.82 is the closing balance as at the end of the year right so i just come and say then it means that under my um, non-current assets i have what my financial assets will be 45.82 million it's in ghana city in millions this is also in Ghana CD in millions. So if you're able to do this, ladies and gentlemen, you will score um, five marks, as the examiner has indicated here. Five cool marks. It looks long, but it is worth the effort. Obviously, if you know this and you're doing it in an exam, it will take you a shorter amount of time to get done. So this is for financial instruments. It's very, very important that you understand this. And that is on financial instruments. Nothing difficult, nothing scary over here. Nothing scary at all. It is within your reach. You can do this. Let's look at the next question, which will be on a very simple standard. So I'm trying to mix them up so that you get some easy ones, some quiet challenging ones um, in one mix. So what is this second question about really? So let's find out shortly. So here... Um, the requirement is what does the examiner want us to do they are saying 
explain with justification the appropriate accounting treatment of the above transaction is for four marks right so for four mark question you know it's nothing too deep but at least you still need to write something so what is the question about we will find out shortly they want us to explain with justification what the treatment is all right so they are saying this is from anyways is from november 2019 fr question 2d what do they say they are saying nabdam limited operates in the media and publications industry and they report under ifrs the 2018 financial statements of nabdam are still in draft form the audit is ongoing and the company intends to authorize a financial statement in april 2019 ladies and gentlemen once you see this remember that they are talking about ias 10 events after the reporting period anytime you see something about authorization of financial statements after year end or they are still in draft let your mind go to ias 10 event after the reporting period so here we know that the company's financials are still in what draft form the audit is still ongoing and they intend to authorize the financials in april right let's keep going to see what information we can find out from here they are saying nabdam rents they rent a distribution warehouse in Kole, located beside the river Odona. On 3rd January 2019, the river Odona best its banks and 650,000 of Nabdam's inventory was destroyed by the flood. The inventory was not insured and Nabdam will not receive any compensation for the loss. The company is not sure how to account for this event. The destroyed inventory is included in the inventory figure that is disclosed on Nabdam's draft statement of financial position as at 31st December 2018. So we found the most important date here, which is what the year end or the reporting date. And we've been told that the year end here is 31st December 2018, right? So, let's go back to the question. If the year end is 31st December 2018 and the audit is still ongoing and they intend to authorize the financials in April 2019, what does it mean? It means that is what a four-month period after the year end. And that is typical, right? Most companies finalize their financials four months after year end anyways, right? So, here... If on 3rd January 2019, which is what, clearly after year end, an event has happened, the question is how will IAS 10 require you to treat this? And as usual, like I do, provide you with a quick overview of the standard to refresh your knowledge and then we solve the question together. So, under IAS 10, which is on events after the reporting period all the standard says is that it defines an event after the reporting period to be any event that occurs let me use a timeline to explain this that occurs between year end and when the financial statements are let me use this financial statements are authorized for issue so any event that happens between the year end and when the financials are authorized for issue is known as an event after the reporting period in this particular question they said what let's come back here they are saying that the company intends to authorize in april 2019 so authorization for issue date is april 2019 we know the company's year end from here to be what december so this is December 2018. So anything that happens between year end, which is December 2018, and April 2019, which is the date of authorization for issue of the financials, is called an event after the reporting period. Are we clear? Now, the standard says there are two types of events after the reporting period. So we have types, so events after the reporting period. We have type 1, which is what? 
known as adjusting events. Adjusting events. And then type 2 is known as what? Non-adjusting events. Now, the standard defines adjusting events to be events that provide further evidence of conditions that existed at year end. So for adjusting events, you are required to what? As the name implies, you are required to adjust the figures as at year end to provide for these adjustments or these changes. For non-adjusting events, if they are material, then you are required to what? Disclose this in the notes to the financial statement. So it disclose in what? In the notes. And then give an estimate of the amount involved. Right? So take note. Any event that occurs between the year-end date and the date when the financials are authorized for issue is what's known as an event after the reporting period. It could either be adjusting events or what? Non-adjusting event. Adjusting events, we adjust for them. We go back and change the figures even though they happen after year end, right? And then on adjusting events, if they are material, we disclose it in the notes, let the shareholders and other stakeholders know. And then we also would let them know an estimate of the amount involved. So in this question, all we're required to do is number one, is this an event after the reporting period? Let's find out. Here they are saying what? On 3rd January, the river burst its banks. So let's come back to our timeline. Our year end is December 2018. Yeah. Authorized for issue April 2019. 3rd January will be somewhere here. So 3rd January. And like I said, any event that occurs between here all the way to here is known as event after the reporting period. So this is clearly an event after the reporting period. Next question is, is it an adjusting event or a non-adjusting event? Let's keep reading. So... They are saying on 3rd January 2019, River Donna burst its banks. So a river just decided to open water, <laughs> burst its banks. And 650,000 CDs of NAPDAM's inventory was destroyed by the flood. Right? The inventory was not insured and they, are, they will not receive any compensation. They are not sure how to account for it. For now, the destroyed inventory is still included in the inventory figure that is disclosed in their financials. So let me give you a clue. The standard says adjusting events are events that provide further evidence of conditions that existed as at year end. Non-adjusting events do not provide further evidence of conditions as at year end. Typical examples of non-adjusting events are um, acts of God, as we can see here. So a flood. Nobody saw this coming. So emergencies, if there's a fire outbreak, so... The examiner likes to use fire outbreaks. So if you see a fire outbreak, you see a flood, you see a hurricane, you see any natural disaster, right? It's a non-adjusting event because no one saw it coming. It does not provide further evidence of a condition that exists as at the end. Examples of adjusting events would be things that provide further evidence of conditions existing as at the end. So example is, if you have a customer that goes into bankruptcy as at the end, then it's an adjusting event because it provides you with further evidence of a condition, which was you had a receivable balance. That balance was most likely impaired. You should have provided for impairment loss on the receivable. So with the going into bankruptcy of your customer, you are now certain that the balance is not recoverable and you need to write off the debt as bad or irrecoverable. Another example of an adjusting event would be if you realize after a year end the actual selling price or net realizable value of inventory, then you can go accord, according to IES to inventory and record what or write down the inventory to the NRV value. So some of these things, just know, typical example, non-adjusting events are usually your act of God. That's a common, very common example. So here, this flood is clearly a non-adjusting event. Non-adjusting, so we will not adjust. So since it's four marks, they said explain with justification. So let's do some little writing here. So let's just, it's four marks, please write. The examiner wants you to write, they said explain. So please tell them about the standard. So we will say IAS 10. 
events after the reporting period prescribes the accounting for events that occur between an entity's year end date and the date when the financials are authorized for issue so you've made your first point take note we are trying to get four marks right so we say next thing is what ias 10 provides for two types of what event after the reporting period please in the exam write the full thing allow me to use shorthand here the first is what say the first is adjusting events the next is non adjusting events so we say adjusting events adjusting events provide further evidence of conditions that existed at year end and must be adjusted for in the financial statements next point non adjusting events so let's even add here the flood is not an adjusting event so we say non-adjusting events do not provide further evidence of conditions that existed as at year end we we'll say the flood is an example of a non adjusting event due to the fact that the event which is the flood and the consequential inventory damage did not exist as at year end so we say as such the financial statements will not be adjusted for this right now we're going to say however ias 10 provides that material non 
adjusting event must be disclosed in the notes to the financial statements including a provision of an estimate of the financial effect or impact so we say as such assuming this damage is material to nabdam then nabdam must disclose in the notes this event that is a flood including a disclosure of the amount of inventory damaged i.e what it told us is this six hundred and fifty thousand cds from here right so you need to disclose this if you're able to make these points right i've made a number of points you get your four marks so your first point about the standard being IS10, you know it. The question did not mention is IS10. So the examiner will give you a mark for mentioning that the standard is IS10. Then mention that IS10 provides for two types of events, which is adjusting events and non-adjusting events. And then you define adjusting events and you state that the flood is not an adjusting event. You get another mark. Then you define an adjusting event. And then you say that the flood is an example and you give a reason why, because it said what? explain with justification so this is what we are doing so we are saying here that um the inventory damage did not exist as at the year end so we are saying this is not an adjusting event it doesn't provide further evidence of a condition that existed then we go on to talk about the accounting treatment proper that if it's a material non-adjusting event then you must disclose it in the notes and provide what an estimate of the financial effect or impact then we go on to say that the company must then disclose the event being the flood and then also disclose the amount of inventory damage being 650,000 cities. If you're able to do this, then you have four marks. So let me pause here for a few questions. Um, let's see if anyone has a question before we continue with our next question on IFRS 16 on leases. So please feel free to ask any questions you have in the comments and then we'll take it from there so we've done um, a number of questions so far on different ifrs's let me know if you have any question and then we'll continue our next question will be on ifrs 16 on leases so for ifrs 16 leases what are you required to know in this particular context i'm sure all of us are aware that IFRS 16 leases has come to replace the old lease standard IAS 17 since 1st January 2019. So it has been mandatory for companies to apply IFRS 16 when it comes to accounting for leases. And leases is actually one topic that features in every single financial reporting exam. So I recommend that everyone practices questions on leases and gets very conversant with these um, topics and concepts. So let's look at this question, which sets a very important component of the standard. And then in day two, we probably look at extra concepts around leases. So let's read the question and see what the requirement is over here. So here, this question is from uh, November 2019. It was question 2C of the financial reporting paper. What is the requirement? I always recommend that you read the requirement first before you read the question. 
So the requirement is saying that in accordance with IFRS 16 leases, show with appropriate calculations the what accounting entries required to record the transaction above in the financial statements for the year ended 31st July 2019. And this is for seven marks. So this is um, quite a huge um, amount of marks or number of marks allocated to one particular question. So it means uh, the examiner wants to really test this concept um, very, very well. So let's read the question. It says on 1st August 2018, in questions of this nature, always take note of the year ends. So you are required to account for the year ended what 31st July 2019. And then on 1st August 2018, the company entered into agreement. So we, we know that we are looking at what a one year period really. All right. So on 1st August 2018, Asawasi Limited entered into an agreement to acquire a motor vehicle. So for IFR 16, as I told you shortly, you need to identify something called the leased asset or whether the contract contains a lease. So here we've, we've identified an asset, which is a motor vehicle. The terms of the agreement were that the vehicle would be leased for five years. So we can call this what the lease term, right? Or the term for the lease from the date of inception subject to a deposit. Please take note of this deposit of 19,972. This is a very good question to test your leases, so please um, pay attention. And also five annual payments of 6,500 in advance. Take note, we have two types of lease payments or two types of lease arrangements. It's either in arrears or in advance please take note it's very very important that you know what the difference is because it could make all the difference um when i'm solving i'll try to show you what it would have looked like if the examiner said in arrears instead of in advance okay so that at least everybody here can benefit from um, a change of word by the examiner in the next exam so in advance commencing on the same date of what first i guess 2018 the fair value of the vehicle and the present value of the lease payments were 48,000 CDs at inception. The interest rate implicit in the lease is 8%. And we've been told to show the um, appropriate calculations and accounting entries to record this transaction in the books. So we have all of this information. As usual, let me give you an overview of the standard so that you know what IFRS 16 says at a high level and then we'll use that knowledge to solve the question. Like I've said, um, your benefit from joining this session is to get a quick review, quick review of every standard we look at here. If we just solve questions, what's the value you have gained? So let's run through IFRS 16. Let me give you a framework and then we will go through the question. So, Right here, give me a second. All right. So, our standard is what? IFRS 16 on leases. Now, let me try and break down the whole standard so that I don't have to do any extra work again, really. But please make sure you still read, but let me try and break it down for you. IFRS 16 on leases gives us two main categories, right? So, you know, in the past, under IS-17, we had two types of leases. It was either what a finance lease or an operating lease, right? What you may not know, there are lots of people who say that IFRS 16 has done away with finance and operating leases. It's not true. When, you know, leases have two main counterparties, you either have who? The lessor and the lessee take note that lessor accounting has not changed materially under is 17 to ifrs 16. lessor accounting still recognizes what a finance lease and what an operating lease so please take note what has changed under ifrs 16 is the accounting by the lessee of a lease right so when it comes to lessee accounting what ifrs 16 has said is that all leases 
must be recognized on balance sheets. On balance sheet. Unless two criteria are met. So all leases should be what? On balance sheet. Unless two criteria are met. What are these criteria? So let me do this. The first is something we call low value leases. So a lease where the assets under consideration are of a low value. In that case, they will not be uh, mandated to be treated under IFRS 6. You can keep them off balance sheet. In that case, you just have to um, write off the related um, rental payments to PNL as an expense over the term, really, right? The next is for assets that have really a lease term of what? Less than 12 months. So if you meet these two criteria, then the standard is saying that you do not need to account strictly according to the requirements of IFR 16 leases and bring all your leases on balance sheet. So take note, IFR 16 leases says all leases should be on balance sheet unless they are low value leases. So here examples would be, um, let's say you buy personal computers or small items of office furniture and their value is so little, then you decide to say they are low value leases, you will not recognize them on balance sheet or the um, lease term is 12 months or less, right? It's less than 12 months and it contains no purchase option, really, less than 12 months. So in that case, like I said earlier, you recognize the expense on a straight line basis in PL, right? Apart from this, now let's look at the proper lease. So these are the exceptions, right? So take note, exception one, low value leases, exception two is what well, less than 12 months. Good. Now let's come to how to account for leases proper. What the standard says is that all leases at inception you need to recognize two things recognize the first thing called a right of use asset or what some people call the rou asset and you also need to recognize something called a lease liability please pay very close attention if you get this you are done for life really when it comes to lease accounting I'm trying to simplify um, the whole thing. So leases at inception, you need to recognize two things, a right of use asset and a lease liability. What the standard says is that the value of the right of use asset equals the lease liability. So it means technically you need to find a lease liability in order to what, find the right of use asset. So the right of use asset equals the lease liability plus what? Any initial direct costs incurred by the lessee, right? And then you can also list any incentives or other benefits received by the lessee prior to or at commencement of the lease, right? So take note, the right of use asset equals the lease liability, which is what we have here, right? Then you will add any other direct costs there let's see how to incur and then you will deduct any incentives they had to um, also they received at the commencement of the lease now how is the lease liability measured the standard says the lease liability equals what okay let me change my pen equals the present value of what who can guess the present value of the lease payments over the lease term so present value of the lease payments over the lease term and by present value means we need to discount some future cash flows to present value and you need to use what rate you need to use discounted at what the interest rate implicit in the lease and you can see they gave us this figure as well this rate as eight percent right so take note i said the right of use asset equals what the lease liability plus direct costs less any incentives right then what is the lease liability in of in and of itself it is what 
the present value of what all um, cash flows related to the lease. So over the lease, the many cash flows you get, you discount the present value using the interest rate implicit in the lease. If this is not given to you, then the standard says you can use the entity's incremental borrowing rate. But most questions I've seen will always give you um, the present value or the interest rate implicit in the lease. Once you've done the subsequent measurement, because the right of use asset is an asset, really, you have an option to um, depreciate the asset over its useful life. So you use the cost model and the IS16, which says that what the current value of an asset, let me change this, the current value of an asset will be what the cost, less any accumulated depreciation, less any accumulated impairment, what losses, right? But the standard gives room for people to measure using the fair value model and the IS40, but that is what if it's an investment property per se. So take note that right of use asset will be subsequently depreciated, just like every normal asset, right? The lease liability will be treated really using a method similar to the amortized cost approach and the IFRS 9 financial instrument. So take note, this is the huge high, I mean, high level summary of IFRS 16. So we need to go through this question and see what type of lease we have and then we'll account for it accordingly. So let's, let's get back to the question. Remember, quick summary, some leases will be off balance sheet, which is the low value lease and those less than 12 months. The ones on balance sheet, you need to find two things, a right of use asset, oops, so this rather, a right of use asset and a lease liability. And I've told you how to find these here, right? Please, if you have any question, leave them in the comments, I will respond to you. So let's get back here, back to the question. Let's take it one more time. Now that we know what the standard really is about. Okay. So what we are being told here is they said we should um, show the accounting entries to record the transaction in the financial statements. Okay. So on 1st August 2018, they entered into an agreement to purchase what a motor vehicle or acquire a motor vehicle. The terms of the agreement were that the vehicle be leased for what? Five years. So number one, we know here that it is not less than what 12 months. So this will not qualify under the less than 12 months exemption. So we need to what, recognize this as what? A proper lease under IFRS 16. So five years from the date of inception. But watch carefully. There is a deposit of 19,972 and five annual payments. So it means because it's five years, Every year, they'll make what? A payment. The same way when you rent an accommodation or you, where you live. You pay your rent, right? On a monthly basis, just in Ghana, they take your, your rent in advance. I mean, total amount in advance. But typically, you make payments, what? Um, on a monthly basis. But here, they are making payments on, on an annual basis. So every year, they make a payment. But here, the payments are made in advance. In advance, let me use a time value of money timeline. In advance means you make the payment what at the start of the year here. So this is in advance. In arrears means you make the payment what at the end of the year. This is very important for you to understand um, leases, how to account for leases. So here they are saying it's in advance. It means we make the first payment on day one, the date of inception. That is when you make payments. You make it in advance means on the first day. Right. If it was in arrears, we would not have accounted for it this way. I'll show you. Right. So, and five annual payments of six thousand five hundred in advance, and they emphasized again that what this was commencing on first August. The examiner is giving you a second clue that please remember that I've made another payment. I've made my first payment on the first day of the lease. So even if you miss the green light he gave you that this lease is in advance, he even mentioned again that this commenced or the payment commenced on what? 1st August 2018. All right, now watch this. They said the fair value of the vehicle and the present value of the lease payment were 48,000 at inception. What did I tell you here? Come here. Remember I told you that at the start of the lease, you need to recognize what? Find your right of use asset, right? And find your lease liability. What did I say? I said the right of use asset will equal what? The lease liability, right? So the lease liability plus direct cost less incentives. The examiner is telling you that he is telling you here that the fair value of the vehicle, 
the fair value of the vehicle and the present value of the lease payments were 48,000. Remember, I told you they must be equal because at inception, the right of use asset will equal what the lease liability. So he's telling you that this figure is 48,000. What it means is that don't waste your time to discount any cash flows to present value. They have done it for you in this question. In some questions, they will not give you this figure and you'll be required to discount to present value. Here, they have given you that figure as a gift, right? So let's take note of this. We already have the initial um, amount to be recognized with respect to this lease. Okay, and they gave us the interest rate implicit in the lease to be what? 8%. Right, so now let's let's start the question. All right, what do we need to do here? Now, please, here, let's go back to our basic double entry accounting, right? That will make us break this question down further. So let's let's do this, right? Let's create some magic here. This question was um, question 2C in the exam um, here. So question 2C, great. What are they telling us? They said what well, the fair value, right here, the fair value of the vehicle and the present value of the lease payments were 48,000. No problem. So we say here that what, as usual, I like to write what the standard is. So IFRS 16 leases prescribes the accounting treatment for leases okay so at inception of the lease a right of use asset of what we said the figure is what right here 48,000 right so 48,000 will be recognized is that okay then the lease liability remember i told you they must be equal right so the lease liability would also have been forty eight thousand. but something will happen take note they are saying that from the date of inception subject to a deposit of nineteen thousand nine seven two. deposit means that come and make an upfront payment to me before i lease the asset to you Maybe I don't trust you that you make payments over the five-year period. So I'm saying that on the first day, please deposit some money down before I give you the car. That's what deposit means. So it means that on the first day, they want you to make a deposit of 19972 And then since the payments are in advance, it means that your first year payment of 6 5 will also be due on that same day one. So let's go back to our double entry accounting, right? Let's do this. We'll say that what? At inception... the lease liability will also be Ghana City 48,000 but what we say subject to the below so let's do the initial double entry so we say what let's do an asterisk initial double entry will be please take now i'm trying to give you more than you need to answer the question right just let's learn let's expand um this so initial double entry here will be what the assets are debit so i debit my right of use asset with forty eight thousand. then i credit my lease liability with forty eight thousand. but hold on it said from the lease liability, we need to what? Make an initial deposit of 19,000. So let's go back and record the initial deposit. So we say recording initial deposit. How would you do that? If you make payment to someone, what do you do? You credit cash or bank, right? So we credit our cash or bank. What's the initial deposit figure they said here? Right here is 19,972. So I credit cash or bank with 19,972. Then I would debit my lease liability to reduce it. Why? When I started the lease, I was owing you 48,000. 
that's what we agreed on if i've made a payment of nineteen thousand, you agree with me that what i don't owe you forty eight thousand anymore i owe you forty eight thousand less than nineteen thousand i've paid right so i debit lease liability with what nineteen thousand nine seven two right then don't forget that we also had to make what a payment in advance on the first day so we'll say also recording payment in advance or let's even say recording what here recording lease payment in advance what was the payment amount they said it was six thousand five hundred cds every year so for year one i will credit my cash or bank credit cash or bank with six thousand five hundred and i'll come and debit my lease liability to reduce it because it will reduce how much i owe under the lease right so i'll debit my lease liability 6500 and this shows how important double entry is right if you know double entry you can breeze through so many of these um, questions so with all of this let's say our lease liability will finally be what lease liability will be remember initially here was what 48000 right so the liability will be 48000 minus what I recorded an initial deposit of what here i debited lease liability with what 19972 so i reduced it with 19972 then minus i also made a payment upfront in advance of 6500 so minus 6500 let me grab my calculator give me a second um so it's going to be 48000 minus 19972 minus six five zero zero i got two one five two eight so this will give me two one five two eight obviously ghana cities right please remember your currency signs so this is the value of my lease liability so take note that initial um recognition what i will have is that my lease liability will be what 21528 then this would be the double entries to so take notes right here double entry for recording the initial deposit is a double entry for recording the lease payment in advance and is a very fair double entry when you start the lease remember this right um, there are some people who want to combine everything so maybe they'll have one double entry debit the ROU asset combine the credits of the cash and the lease liability into one but it depends on you but this is a systematic way of breaking everything down in the end we know that our right of use asset is forty eight thousand. our lease liability is what um 21528 now with this out of the way what do we need to do next remember i told you that for what for a lease asset you need to depreciate it like you would normally right so we say and uh, subsequent measurement the right of use asset will be depreciated as follows so remember the right of use asset is still 48000 right from here it's still 48000 yeah so depreciation and this is straight line how do i know a straight line the question said what it is what a five-year lease right so we are simply just going to divide by five years and that will give us the lease so it's going to be what you know depreciation equals cost let me even write this cost minus residual value or what scrap value anyone you want to call it divided by what useful life right this is a basic depreciation um, formula. So our cost is going to be 48,000. We don't have any scrap value, residual value, so that will be zero divided by what? Five. What does this give me? Calculator. Um, 48,000 divided by five gives me 9,600. So this is 9,600 per annum, right? So my depreciation charge is 9,600, right? So if this is the case, then what will be the closing value of my 
um, right of use asset. So it's simply going to be what? So my carrying value or what the net book value of what the right of use asset will simply be what 48,000, which is the initial cost minus depreciation of 9,600, right? This will give me 48,000 minus 9,600 will give me 38,400, right? But please, the examiner emphasized that we should show the accounting entries required. So I'm guessing here he has a deep desire to see you do double entry. So let's go back to double entry basics. How do you record depreciation, right? So we would debit depreciation expense. This would be in PNL, right? Of how much we got 9,600. And then we come and credit accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation for the right of use asset of what 9,600. Let's do this debit, um, these double entries for the examiner because he's asked for them in the question. So this 9,600 entry will record the depreciation, right? Even though we know that at the end of the year, our current value will be 38,400, right? Let's keep going. Then for the lease liability, remember I told you something about it, what it being under a similar model to the amortized cost approach and the IFRS 9 financial instruments. If you remember, I did one a few minutes ago, right, just today, um, and uh, financial instruments. So that table I did where we had what opening, um, opening, beginning balance, payments, that table, right? We're going to we'll use a similar approach here. Just that here, because it's in advance, something will change slightly, right? Because the default is when payments are in arrears, but here it's in advance. So I'll show you what modification we need to make to the table to get this done. So let's um, open our table. So here's going to be, remember I told you, you have your year. Oops. You have your opening balance, right? Then you have your payments. Because this is in what? In arrears, you need to make payments. I mean, it's in advance, you need to make payments um before you compute the interest amount payable right then you get total then what do you do you compute what interest on the amount then you get what your closing so this is the first year now here what is the opening balance for the lease liability let's take note here that in year one how much payment did i make I made what 6,500, right? Right here, that's the initial amount I made. Now the opening balance, how do I find it? Let me show you. The lease liability amount was what? Let's, let's do a small working here. Was 48,000, right? They said I had to make a deposit of what? 19,972. So it's going to be what? 48,000. Minus my 19972, that'll give me what 28028, right? Now, on this 28028, from this figure, then I made a payment of 6500 upfront, so minus 6500, and that gave me what 21528. So you can see that the 21528 we have here, right? This figure right here. Is the same figure we have here. So what you need to do is, if you are preparing a schedule, please take note carefully. If you are preparing a schedule for payments made in arrears, or no, sorry, payments made in advance, it's supposed to be your year. Let me properly draw the table. It will be your year. Your opening balance will come. Then the payments, the least payment, the question will tell you you pay on an annual basis will come next. You get a total column. Then you apply interest, then you get the closing balance. What interest rate will we apply? Right here, they said interest rate implicit in the lease is what, 8%. So I put here what, 8%. So let's just find 8% of 21528, right? So 8% on this figure right here. So that gives us a time 0 
gives me one seven one seven two two point two four right so this amount is the interest charge that would serve as what the least liability interest in PL, right? Then the closing balance will simply be so we add the 1722 to this figure, right? So you add the interest charge to 21528, and this will give you 23250. So 23. 250.24 right point two four so this amount is the value of the lease liability that will be in the um, balance sheet as at year end now for very smart students what you want to do is this amount please try and break it down into what the current liability and the non-current liability component this will give you extra marks. It's fine if you leave it, but you're not going to score the full marks. So you need to break it down. How do I know what to be current liabilities? Remember that this lease is what is in advance. So I make the first payment at the start of the year. So let's ask ourselves, from this year end, right? What payment will be due next, within the next 12 months, that will be current liability? It is the next 6,500 payments I have to make, right? So my, my next 6,500 payment that I will make Actually, literally the next day after this year, and that's the first day of the next year, will be what? 6,500. Then the difference between 6,500 and this figure right here will be the non currents that will go into subsequent um, years of the lease. So minus 6,500 will give me 16,750.24. So 0.24. Right, so please remember that it's good to split the um, lease liability into current and non current liabilities. Now, let me show you how it would have looked like if the question said payments were in arrears, right, and not in advance. All you do in your table is watch this you have your year, you have your opening balance, but instead of having payments here, right, what you do is you rather compute interest so you swap the interest column here with the payment column here there will not be any total column that's all right because the payments happen at the end of the year so you need to compute interest first right then opening compute interest on the opening balance then you less your payment and then you get your closing balance so please take note if the question said the payments were rather in arrears then this is what you'd have done so year one you put your opening balance here you compute interest which is eight percent on this figure right then here you layer the lease payment which is the six thousand five hundred then you get your closing figure right so please take note if the question says it's in arrears this is what you'd have done right but we don't need this in this um, particular question so take note let's let's continue so we've recognized the lease liability or will be on the balance sheet we are still doing double entry because the question has said clearly that showed accounting entry so this interest of 1722 how do i book it in my financials it's very simple i told you it's going to p and now it will go as what a finance cost so all i would do is i would debit finance costs right which will be in PL of what 1722.24. Then I will credit my lease liability. Remember that the lease liability increases by the amount of the finance cost, right? So I'll credit my lease liability. It is similar to amortization of what um, debt instruments under IFRS 9. Very similar. So I credit my lease liability. This will be on the statement of financial position. With one seven two two point what two four, right? So this would be the double entry for my lease liability. So let's now go and they said show what um the accounting entries to record the transactions. All right, so let's show quick extracts in the books. So let's do the extracts in the financials. 
So in the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income for the year ended, 31st July 2019, please in the exam write the full thing of um, Splossy. Don't just use abbreviations like I've done here. I can, but you can't, right? So you need to show two things. You need to show your depreciation expense. And then you need to show what your finance cost. We found these already. So depreciation expense, we got this to be um, 9,600, right? Just here. So I record 9,600 as depreciation expense in PL. 9600 then the finance cost will be the figure i got here right 1722.24 so 1722.24 so this is what will go to pnl then let's go to the balance sheet so statement of financial position as at what 31st july 2019 in this FP, take note, you have two things to record. The right of use asset and then what? The lease liability. So under my non-current assets, I will record what? My right of use asset. Take note, this would be the net book value of the ROU asset, which will be what the cost minus what accumulated depreciation. So this will simply be, if you remember, the ROU asset was 48,000 right here. Good. Yes, I have it here. So 48,000 minus depreciation of what? 9,600. So let's just repeat that here. So 48,000 minus 9,000 what? 600. And I think that gave us, was it 38 something? Yes, 38,400. Okay. So 38,400. This would be my right of use asset. So I'm done with the non current asset side. Then under my liabilities, I'll have to remember I told you we have two liabilities. So I need to split into what? My non current liabilities. And here I can just call it lease obligation. Or some companies will say lease liability, but the proper term in most cases will be lease obligation. Then I also have another lease obligation under what? My current liabilities. So here I'm saying that take note that, let me write lease obligation, that the current portion will be what is due within the next 12 months. And since this question is saying that the lease is what? In advance. It means that what will be due within the next 12 months will be my first 6,500 payment, which is due what? Right after the year has started. So it means my current liability will be what? 6,500. Then the non-current portion will be the difference. Difference between what? Difference between the total liability here at the year end of 23,250 and then 6,500. So 23,250.24. So this is simply be the balancing figure between 23,250.24 minus what? This portion that I'm saying is what? Current, right? So minus 6,500. Minus 6,500. This would give me what? Um, calculator, give me a second. 23,250.24 minus 6,500. Will give me sixteen thousand seven fifty point two four. Let me write this well. Sixteen seven fifty point two four. So that is it really for um IFR sixteen leases. If you are able to do this, you will score what seven marks. It's quite high. I think this is one of the highest allocations they give for a sub question in question two. Right, so that, that's it for IFR 16 leases. Let's still move on to our next standard. We are doing so many um, standards today. Our next standard will be on IAS 12 income taxes. It's an area many people are not too familiar with. So let's take a look at it um, and let's, let's look at this question. So the next question is saying that the required 
as usual, I always say read the requirement, right? Before you read the question. So here, the required is to explain the appropriate accounting treatment. And technically, they are saying explain, right? So write English. That's what they are saying. Don't come and compute anything. Tell us in English. Explain the appropriate accounting treatment of the above transaction for the year ended 31st, August 2019. Okay. It's for three marks. So it means please get a job done quickly and move on with your life. Don't come and write full um, four pages. You won't score any marks here. Okay. Let's start reading the question. And here it was from November 2019. Financial reporting. Question 2A. Right. So... Um, how do you pronounce this? Is it Daho or Da whatever? So Daho Limited manufactures and distributes security equipment. Daho prepares financial statements in accordance with what international financial reporting standards up to 31st August each year. So we know that's your year end. On 31st August 2019, please take note of the dates. Dates are very important in accounting in general the tax liability account take note it's a liability account liability accounts have what credit balances right in the books of Daho limited showed a debit balance this is strange a liability account must show a what credit balance but here they are saying it shows a debit balance it means something i'll tell you shortly show the debit balance of seventeen thousand five hundred after paying the 2018 liability. So it means they've already paid the 2018 liability. Don't mix this up. They've already paid the 2018 liability. Okay. The estimated liability for 2019 is 84,500 and no entry has been made to record this. So they are saying explain the appropriate accounting treatment for this. Now, to get this done, IS-12 income taxes really, I mean, what did I say? IS-12, um, yeah, IS-12 income taxes. It talks about the requirements for what? Accounting for income taxes. And gives such requirements for two main types of taxes. Either you're talking about current taxes or you're talking about what? Something called deferred taxes. Deferred taxes arise from something known as temporary differences. Since this question is talking about current taxes, let's focus on this. I will do another question, most probably... Um, on Saturday, that's when we meet next, right? Yeah, Saturday. And then we will look at how to account for deferred taxes. But for now, let's look at this question on current taxes. The bonus for you is that this, this question can even appear in a note toward a published accounts question where they give you this note and you're required to adjust for it, right? Okay, let's look at how current taxes are even accounted for. Let me make you understand how current taxes are accounted for. Now, every company, right? When the year ends, so I'm sure if you see a typical um, profit or loss, please pay attention so that you can understand this um, really well. If you look at a typical profit or loss statement, what does it look like? So you have your profit or loss and what other comprehensive income. So you start from your revenue, you get your cost of sales, you get your gross profit, right? You get your selling general admin. You have some finance costs, right? Then you get what? Your profit before tax, really. Then you get your tax line, right? Then you get profit after tax or profit for the year. Profit for the year. My focus here is on this tax line. What goes here? There are many people who think that it's just picking the corporate tax rate and applying it on the tax or the profit before tax. That is wrong, right? This tax line includes three things. And I want you to memorize. I'll give you an acronym. If you want to um, remember, you can use something called C-U-D, right? So card or card or card, whatever you want to mention, right? So CUD will help you remember what goes into the tax line. And please memorize this to help you, even in published accounts questions. What does the C stand for? The C stand for what? Current tax. So current tax for the year will feature here. And current tax, this is what I mean by what? What tax is due this year for you to pay to the revenue authority? 
That is what you get by what? Multiplying the tax rate to not the profit before tax, but what the adjusted profit. And I don't want to go into tax here, but I pick the profit before tax. You add back things that are what disallowed. And then what you arrive at your adjusted profits before tax, or what we call chargeable income in tax. You apply the rate, which in Ghana is 25% for general companies, but this is not a tax class. So let's forget about it. C is for current tax. U is for what? Underpayment. So you can even have underpayment or overpayment of taxes. So please, the U is underpayment, but please in your mind, remember that it can be what? Also overpayment. I'm just made it, making a card so you can remember. You can make it COD for court if you want to make yours overpayment, right? But card, current taxes, underpayment, overpayment. And then the final one is what? D, which is what? Deferred tax movement. Right? You just compare the opening deferred tax balance and the closing deferred tax balance for the year. The movement, the difference is what you bring here. Right, so whether it's a deferred tax asset or liability and has increased, then you do that appropriate double entry. Here, the question is focusing on two things. They are saying that what it's possible there has been an underpayment. Let me even make it this. Let's use the appropriate terms. Under provision, right? So this is under provision or what over provision. Right, so under provision over provision, under payment over payment, whatever. Right, in either case, you either paid more than you were supposed to pay, right, or you paid less than you were supposed to pay. That's the whole point. So it's either you under provided, you under paid, or you were over provided, or you overpaid, whatever it is. But just take note that the U stands for the variance between what you should have paid and what you actually paid. And if it's for the previous year, not the current year. Take note of that. Okay. So back to our question. They are saying that on 31st August 2019, which is what the year end, the tax liability account showed a debit balance. I've said liability should have a credit balance, right? Let's even analyze this and ask ourselves under what circumstance would what a liability account show a debit balance? So let's do this and let's find out if they under provided or over provided for taxes. And take note the question is saying that what? after paying the 2018 liability, so it means they've paid. So let's create a hypothetical T account and let's put in numbers. So let's call this the, the tax payable account, or this would be what my current tax account, right? Okay, it's a liability account, so it has a credit balance, right? So let's say in this account, I made a provision for, let's say, I'm trying to look at scenarios where it will have a debit balance, right? So for something to have a debit balance, what it means is that what? It should have more debit entries, right? It should have more debit entries here than credit entries. So that the balance carried down will be here. So that the balance brought down comes here. That's the only case I'll get what? A debit balance. So let me use numbers so that it makes sense to everybody here. So here, what will I do to have more um, debit entry? So let's say my, um, let's say current tax payable, what I estimated to pay was what? 100. Then the tax authority said I should pay what? 200. So how, how do I pay 200? I will come and what? Credit bank with 200 and I'll debit my tax payable account my handwriting debit my tax payable account with 200 so i come here since the credit went to bank right i'll come here and say what in the name of bank here is 200 you can see now this what the debit side out outstrips or it exceeds the credit side what does this mean this means that what i under provided so under provision, right? This is an under provision. So it means if you have a debit balance on your current tax account, it means there's an under provision. So what would you do here? What you would do here is that how do I close off this account? The total is 200. 
right so my imbalance carry down will be what 100 so my imbalance brought down in the next period will be what 100 so i have a debit balance what this illustrates to us is that what when you have under made an under provision of taxes we provided for 100 but we have to pay more so when you under provide or when you overpay they are polar opposites right when you under provide then that is when you need to what you have a debit balance so when you under provide how do you make this entry in the books please take note this figure of 100 and 200 is just for illustration purposes so let me clean it before anyone gets confused it was just to teach us that what um when you have a debit balance to be an under provision okay so back to this question what it means is that in our what they are saying this is what they said in our taxation liability account so let's open what they said taxation liability account we have a debit balance of what seventeen thousand five hundred so this is this will be our balance brought down now this is the balance that remains after we have what paid our tax for last year what must you do this year take note that this balance is something that you have already paid remember the example i showed you with 100 and 200 right it is only in your books because it is outstanding as a provision it doesn't mean you owe GRE this amount. You don't owe the tax authority this amount. You've already made payment for more than. So this amount here just must be cleared and taken to PL to close off. You've paid this amount. You've paid excess of this amount already, anyways, right? So what we need to do is well, you will credit this account 17500 in the name of PL to cancel this amount. So we'll debit the tax line. In profit or loss with 17500 and then we credit what this liability account so tax liability account with 17500 what it means is that we are going to increase the tax expense in profit or loss this figure here by the amount of the under provision so what you can learn here is that because of the double entry, we'll credit this account to close it here, right? And then the debit goes towards PL. So that's the first step. Next thing they told us here is that the estimated liability for 2019 is 84,500, and no entry has been made to reflect this, right? How do you record current tax liability for every year? It is simple. You will credit what? your tax payable account they said is what 84 500 and then you debit the tax expense or the tax line <clears throat> in profit or loss with what 84 500 so what that means is that what here we will come in right from the what I said here, we credit tax payable account 84500. So here, 84500 will come here. It will go to what PNL. What you can see, ladies and gentlemen, is that in the end, two entries go to PNL 175 and 845. Right? If you watch it carefully, we are debiting the tax expense in PNL with 845, also debiting with what the prior year um understatement or under provision. So what will happen here is that the sum is what goes to what profit or loss. So the sum of what 17,500 being the previous year's what under provision plus the current year liability of what 84,500. Let me grab my calculator. So 17,500 plus um, 84,500 will give me 102. 102,000. This is what will go to profit or loss as tax payable for the year. So now let's answer the question, right? They said explain. So let's explain. What would I have written in the exam? So we'll say because of what we've done, we, we should know that what um let's even do this. <clears throat> we'll say when a debit 
balance shows on the tax account this indicates an under provision from the previous year right we've made the first point and here that year was what the 2018 year all right good then we say what based on the double entry below this under provision must be added to the tax charge in profit or loss so let's just repeat this double entry here right so we debit income tax expense of what seventeen five hundred and we credit what tax liability of what tax payable account with seventeen five hundred. So we are done with this second point. We need to make three to make three points, right? Then we'll say that the current tax payable for the 2019 year will be booked as a current liability and reflected reflected in profit or loss for the year this is shown below so what i do show this here if you remember the second entry right here so i credit my tax payable account with how much 84500 then i debit my what income tax expense line in profit or loss with 84500 so we say final point to make that we finish this question the total amount recorded as income tax expense in profit or loss for the year is what we found the total here to be what right here one zero two thousand is one zero two thousand then final thing the statement of financial position will show a current liability of what remember right here this figure eighty four thousand five hundred because it's going to tax payable account right it has not been paid yet it's, it will be paid in the following year of what eighty four thousand five hundred if you can do this you have what three marks so this is on is 12 income taxes 
So our next question we'll be doing will be based on what IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers. So our next question here, like I said, will be on um, IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers. Now on this standard, there's also a standard um, on revenue um, recognition that has come to replace the old revenue standard, which is what the old IAS 18 revenue. This standard has come to do a number of things. Most important thing is that it has been effective from 1st January 2018. So entities have been required to mandate truly really what apply um, IFRS 15 to their accounting for revenue or for their revenue recognition purposes in the financial statement. Now, there are so many things we need to know under IFRS 15. Before we go through the overview, let's read the question and see what the examiner requires of us. So here, as usual, let's read the requirement first. The required is what they are saying in accordance with the IFRS 15 revenue from contracts with customers justify the appropriate accounting treatment for the above transactions in the financial statement of a jura for the year ended 31st December. So that is our requirement. What are we required to do apart from this so let's read this is from the may 2020 sitting it was question 2a right so a Jura limited is a manufacturing and retail company which prepares financial statements i think this is the last thing we'll do today um some of us are tired <laughs> then we'll continue in date so, so let's let's finish up with this and revenue recognition question and then we move on a Jura limited is a manufacturing and retail company which prepares financial statements in accordance with ifrs up to 31st december each year right in order to generate or improve sales on one of its older products a Jura offered a promotion named something for free the promotion included free maintenance services for the first two years. On 1st October 2019, under the promotional offer, a Jura sold goods to a supermarket chain for 4.4 million CDs. A two-year maintenance contract would normally be sold for 0 0.5 million, that's 500,000 CDs. And the list price of the product would normally be 5 million CDs. The transaction has been included in revenue at what 4.4 million. So what are we required to do here? So you're saying according to the IFRS 15 revenue from contract with customers justified appropriate accounting treatments for the above transaction. So this is what we've been given. Let's quickly run through IFRS 15. What do you need to know under the standard? Let me give you a quick summary as usual. That will give you a comprehensive um, overview. And then we look at the question. IFRS 15 gives us a so-called five-step model. Five-step model for recognizing what revenue. So step one is to what? Identify the contract with the customer. Step two is what who can guess identify clean this identify the performance obligations within the contract step three is to determine the transaction price then step four is to allocate the transaction price to each performance obligation and then step five is what you recognize revenue as and when an entity satisfies each performance obligation it's that simple right now with this knowledge or armed with this knowledge what must we do please memorize this five-step model there's no way you um be faced with an IFRS 15 question and you should say you don't know the five-step model. 
please learn the five step model step one identify the contract with the customer step two is identify the performance obligations in the contract what must you do in the contract must you supply goods must you provide services step three is determine the transaction price what is the price you guys have agreed that the contract will be worth how much would you will be payable as consideration and determine that then remember in step two you determined or identified performance obligations now if you have more than one performance obligation then it's simple make sure you allocate the transaction price to each performance obligation you share it for them based on the um some format or some formula right and then step five is as and when you satisfy each obligation in the contract you need to what recognize revenue so here in this question to be honest they are testing step four in this question step four of the five step model which is what to allocate the transaction price to each performance obligation because this question has more than one performance obligation i don't know if you saw it but i'll go through again for you to see so we need to allocate the standard gives us guidance and says that when it comes to allocating the performance obligation if you have something known as stand alone prices or standalone selling prices of what similar goods or identical goods right so standalone selling prices of what identical or similar goods and you use that as the basis to what allocate the transaction price to each performance obligation right so here they've given us all of that information let's utilize that to solve this particular question okay so here we have listed the five step model so let's quickly go through so we say in this question transaction price equals what let's find that here they said what a jura sold goods to a supermarket chain for 4.4 million so would you agree with me that a transaction price is 4.4 million because that is what they sold the, the the whole item transaction for right so here it's going to be 4.4 million so 4.4 million is my transaction price right now let's find what performance obligations take note we've already listed the words you'd have listed the five step model up here right in the exam just spread out your work neatly what are the performance obligations let's read through in order to generate or improve sales a jura offered a promotion named something for free the promotion includes free maintenance services for two years and then what the next one is what um the products right so maintenance services and then what goods sold so the obligations are two a juror has to what sell goods so we will say what sale of goods or products and then what um maintenance services from here right maintenance services maintenance services so these are our two obligations so we need to allocate the transaction price to each performance obligation so in fact this will be this is step two of the five step model transaction price this is step three right you can bring step two before step three so let next thing is so asterisk here asterisk here so step four we are going to what allocate the transaction price to each performance obligation right remember i told you to be on the basis of what right here where is it yes standalone selling prices right and the question gave us this let me show you where they are saying that what 
a two-year maintenance contract would normally be sold for 0 0.5 million and the list price of the product would normally be 5 million so it means if you went to another shop take note that here the company is giving you they are saying what the, pro the promotion is called something for free so you are actually buying a good but they are giving you services for free by frs 15 is saying that hold on the services that is being delivered as part of the goods is a separate performance obligation so we need to what value it separately we need to split it separately and because revenue of um, revenue cognition or the obligation to perform will occur at different times for goods and services we need to split them and account for them what separately so they gave us a standalone selling prices we need to use that as what a benchmark so let's find this we say standalone selling prices what do we have two year maintenance contract will be what Ghana CD 0 0.5 million given to us here right then if I was buying only the products they are saying the list price of the product equals what 5 million right 5 million so my total standalone selling price is what Ghana CD 5.5 million right it is this 5.5 million total standalone selling price that will serve as the basis on which I will allocate what the um the transaction price to each performance obligation so remember that my transaction price in this question is what right here 4.4 million right so i'm going to share this 4.4 million between the two obligations i identified first is what sale of goods or products and then maintenance services that's all i'm going to split 4.4 between two obligations but i'll use this as the basis so it's going to be a simple fraction i mean proportion so we'll see what allocation of performance obligation to transaction price so we'll say sale of products what's it going to be if you watch here carefully sale of products is what the component is 5 million so we're going to be what 5 over total is what 5.5 right over 5.5 times what's the total we are sharing what right here 4.4 that's all so times 4.4 million so calculator um, 5 divided by 5.5 times what 4.4 this will give me what 4 million so it means out of the 4.4 total revenue 4 million is for for sale of products the next thing I'll allocate, so take note, 4 million is for the sale of the product. The next thing to be allocated is what? The two year maintenance contract. Once again, what's the proportion here? It is what? 0 0.5. So I'll take 0 0.5 divided by the total of 5.5, right? So it's going to be 0 0.5 divided by 5.5 times what my total of 4.4 million and this obviously a difference with 0 0.4 but let's just do for so 0 0.5 divided by 5.5 times 4.4 gives me what 0 0.4 million right so it means out of my 4.4 total revenue to be recognized 4 million relates to sale of products and 0 0.4 million relates to what the two-year maintenance contract but as the name implies it is for two years so we need to what, spread it out evenly but watch the question carefully when are we reporting for it's very important we are reporting for what 31st December 2019 and you see good if we are reporting for 31st December 2019 what must we know what we must do first of all is that 
Because the year end is 31st December, ask ourselves one question. When did we sell the product? Watch it. We sold it on what? 1st October 2019. So technically, what it means is that we only have October, November, December. Three months in this year to report revenue. But when it comes to IFRS 15 on revenue from contracts with customers, the standard says that what? For the sale of goods, revenue be recognized when the goods are what, delivered to the customer or when property in the goods passes from what the seller to the buyer. So here we can say that what, how will we account for this? Simple. Let's say, um, not this, revenue to be recognized. Let's say in the period to 31st December 2019 will be what? Simple. Sale of product will be what? The full 4 million here, right? Because we've sold the product. Once you sell the product, you're entitled to what? Book revenue. Right, but how much of the uh, maintenance contract can be booked? Take note: the question said what it is for the first two years. So, if it's for the first two years, and we sold it on first October twenty nineteen, and we must report for December twenty nineteen, what does it mean? We have October, November, December. That's three months. Two years will give you what twenty four months. That's twelve times two, right? So for the two year maintenance contract, revenue to be recognized will be what three months out of what twenty four months times how much? What did we get? We got right here zero point four, right? So times zero point four million. What would that give us? So calculator. Three months out of 24 months times 0.4. That give me 0.05 million. So total revenue to be recognized this year will be what? My 4 million plus my 0.05 million. And that will give me 4. 4.05 million. So this is revenue that will go to what? My income statement, first line as what? Revenue from contracts with customers. This would be my revenue for the um, period, the three month period to the end of the year. But hold on, what happens? Remember, we said what? The total two-year maintenance contract is 0 0.4. So how will we book that? There's something called deferred revenue. If it is deferred revenue, then how will we record this amount? Deferred revenue means revenue that you have not earned yet. Revenue that you can only record, record when what? You have what? Provided the related services. So in that particular case, here, we'll say what? Deferred revenue, some people say deferred income is the same thing. Deferred revenue will simply be what? The total of what? 0 0.4 million, right? So the 0 0.4 million minus what? How much is due for the three months that we have satisfied? Minus 0 0.05. Take note that because it's a service, until you've satisfied or provided that service to the customer, you cannot recognize revenue. Unlike a good or a product that once you sell, you are due to the entitled to and recognize revenue here 0 0.4 minus 0 0.05 will give me 0 0.35 million. So 0 0.35 million will be my deferred revenue, and this will be recorded in what my non current liabilities. Obviously, you can split it into um, two, current and non-current. So the 12-month um, portion of this, let's even do that, right? So 
Um, let's even make this. Let's do the proper thing. So I know my total deferred revenue is 0 0.35. How much of it to be current? So let's split into current and non-current. My current liability, and please it's a liability, right? Because you have literally um, entered into a contract to provide someone with a, um, a particular service, right? So you owe them that obligation. As and when you satisfy that obligation, then you debit the deferred revenue account, and then you credit revenue to recognize that revenue in your profit or loss. So the current liability amount, remember current liability is anything that is due what, within 12 months or less. So 12 months out of your 24 months, right, times 0 0.35 will be the current liability portion. So 12 by 24 is definitely half times 0 0.35. This would give me 0 0.175 million. This is the current liability portion. Then what will be the non-current liability portion? My non-current liability will be the remainder. Take note it's 24 months, right? If it's 24 months, let's do the math quickly. It's 24 months. I've already recognized what's three months here can you see so minus three then i've said that what there will also be some 12 months for the current liability so minus 12 what do we have left it's going to be 24 minus 3 minus 12 that give us what nine months so the current liability i mean the non-current liability portion will be the remaining nine months out of 24 months times 0 0.35 and that will give me 9 over 24 times 0 0.35. That should give me 0 point, what? 13125 million. So technically, when I add a non-current portion, which is 0 0.13125, to the current portion of what? 0 0.175. It should give me the no hold on i think i made a mistake with the apportionment give me a second um 9 over 24 times 0 0.35 i think that's it is it so this plus 0 0.175 gives me 0 point hold on so okay if I add 0 0.175, which is um, this one here, to my 0 0.13125, so 0 0.13125, to my what? 0 0.05 here, 0 0.05, then yes, it should give me my 0 0.35 right here, right? So that, that's it really for... Um, splitting the key takeaway point for you here should be the fact that when it comes to revenue recognition remember that there is what a five-step model step one is to identify the contract with the customer step two is to identify the performance obligations within the contract step three is to determine the transaction price step four is to allocate the transaction price to each performance obligation and step five is to recognize revenue as and when each performance obligation is satisfied. So we've used the five-step model to go through this. Remember, we use something called standalone selling prices to do the allocation. So at this point, let's let's pause um, for day one. We will continue on Saturday when we do um, day two of the IFRS um, deep dive. As usual, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments and we'll jump in there to provide you with answers so if you, obviously if you found this helpful please hit the like button smash the like button and don't forget to um, invite your fellow students to join us on the second day of the ifrs deep dive so i'll catch you on saturday enjoy the rest of your evening bye bye